our viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. As we take another step deeper into the Word of God in this wonderful book of Romans. And we believe you are going to be mighty blessed. Invite somebody to join you. And let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you yes, Lord. for the reading of your word, yes, for the life that is in the word. Mm -hmm. Let it come alive in us yes, and to all the hearers. Mm -hmm. Cause them to respond to this word, yes, to the praise and glory mm -hmm. of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Today's reading will be taken from the book of Romans, chapter 2. We'll be picking up from verse 12 to verse 16. Let's read. The Bible says, For as many as have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. But the doers of the law will be justified. For one Gentiles, who do not know the law by nature do the things in the law these although not having the law are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. And between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Throughout my journey of faith, as I go around teaching the word of God, there are several questions that keep coming. And the theme is mainly around those that have not had the gospel. For example, children who are born and don't have the opportunity to judge between right and wrong. When they die, where do they go? How about people who have never had the opportunity of listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ? When they die, what happens to them? And the questions like, will they also stand before God? Like we saw last week. So will God apply the same standard or he will deviate the curve so that they are judged on a lesser platform? So will God use a moderated standard of morality? Or will he judge them based on their character? Or if they were religious and they were sincere people, can God elevate them? 
and accept them because they were sincere. Now, these questions and a lot of others cloud our minds every day. And today we will attempt through the word of God that we just had, that we just read, to answer some of these questions. And I know your heart will be at rest. Now, we began by explaining and Paul was writing to the church in Rome. In chapter 1 and verse 18. And said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness? Basically, I told you that this word is revealed is present continuous. So what is happening here is that every individual who is neither a believer in Jesus Christ is under the wrath of God. Because as per God's standard, they don't meet the requirement. Believe it or not, there is no middle ground here. All of them have are under the wrath of God. And in verse 19, Paul further adds, he says, for that which is known about God is evident within them. God has made it evident to them. So there is a degree of revelation that comes to every man that comes to every person that speaks about the identity of who God is. Now, when we don't recognize God for that, for who he is and what he has done in creation, then we are under the wrath of God. In verse 20, he goes on to tell us that for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what he has made so that they are without excuse. So creation declares the glory of God. And everyone, whether you have heard the gospel or not heard of the gospel, you know that there is a God. Whether you admit it or not, there is a first cause responsible for all the creation around you. Now, on the background of this, Paul then comes back to address how will those people be judged? God has revealed himself through the general revelation. And there is the special revelation that brings salvation. Now I am speaking to the one who has received the general revelation of who God is. But has not accepted accepted the gospel. They have clung to their religion. They have 
have clung to their culture. They have clung to their philosophy. And overlooked the saving grace that is available to every man. That has been availed to us at the cross of Calvary. And the Bible here tells us Bible. that they are those that have sinned without the law. So here, the Bible tells us Bible. in verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish. So it is not just those that have received the gospel and rejected it. Those who have never had the gospel are not innocent either. So like those who have had the gospel and suppressed it and refused it. Those who have not had are still sinners. And they will likewise perish. Why? Because sin is the Greek word hamatia, which means to miss the mark. Now, for you to understand it is somebody getting an arrow and a bow and try to shoot at a mark. That is said. Now, when they fail to hit the bullseye, then they have missed the mark. That is what sin is all about. With sin, you fail to hit God's mark of holiness. When we talk about sin, you have not reached God's perfection in life. So you are not in a state of innocence. You are in a state of unrighteousness. You have not met God's standard. So it is not that you are not innocent. No, you, you, are, you are not innocent. In other words, you are guilty. Why are you guilty? Because you have missed God's mark. So his standard of righteousness, which is the Greek word is that you have failed to meet that standard. And here they say, you will perish. How? 12b to 13. Says, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Now, I want you to note a certain word here. It is the word also. What does it mean? It means whether you have the law or you don't have the law you are going to perish. And that's very important. Why? Because all of us fail to meet God's requirement of the law. So that is why Jesus came. So we all missed the mark. We are all candidates to perish. Now, the word perish is the Greek word apolimi, which points to an eternal state of destruction or damnation. So what does it mean from the statement that we just saw? When he says, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish 
without the law. Bwa yogera nti bonna abayo nonanga watali mateka bajja kuzikirira awatali mateka. What he means? Amakuru gacho. One is that without the gospel you are going to perish. Na watali njiri ogenda kuzikirira. But it also says. Na yera yongera and it the implication of also means. Nero ne chigambe echo era chitegeza. Is that even those who are of the law are going to perish. Na ba bali na mateka bagenda kuzikirira. Why because all of us come short of meeting God's requirement of the law. Kubanga fina twale mu kutukirira ku bisanyizo katonda yabateka okutukiriza amateka. We miss the mark of God's standard. So, without salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, yes, we are going to perish. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 18 it gives the indication that you are actually perishing right now. It's like you are first a self-destruct battle that will go on until eternity unless God intervenes to eliminate your heart with the light of the salvation by Christ Jesus. So in verse 13, Paul begins to expound on verse 12. And he says, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So you see where it draws the line? So those who are under the law are going to be judged under the law. And because they don't meet the standard, they will perish. Then those who are without the law, like those who are under the law, will also perish. Why? Because according to the doing of the law, they have not met the mark. So who is he addressing when he talks about those who are under the law? Here he was addressing the Jews. The ones that had directly received the law. And they were accountable to fulfilling the requirements of the law. So here Paul points out that they will be judged by the standard that is in the law. So it is not an expounds this and says it is not just the healers of the law that are just before God. So it, it is not committing the law to memory. No, it is you committing to do to obey what the law says. So they were to keep the law. And in keeping all the law, that is when they would be justified by God. And Paul here points it to us that keeping the law requires obedience. Every one of us, it is not just hearing. We need to apply what we have heard what we have believed. In putting it another way, our faith in Jesus Christ should inform every action of our lives. In chapter 1, and verse 5, Paul talks about the obedience of faith. So he's, what he's trying to imply here is that obedience 
comes from a point of faith. Or putting it another way. When you believe, it should result into obedience. All your obedience points to your faith. You see, there is nothing, there is no such thing as Faith that produces disobedience. All true serving faith should produce obedience. So, I putting it another way, obedience is a fruit of salvation. Faith in this instant becomes the root that draws the nourishment that produces the fruit of obedience. And Jesus Christ put it very plainly in one of his teachings on the mount. In Matthew chapter 7, a scripture many of us don't want to read. And even those who read it try to try to bring an interpretation about it. Because it points out something very critical concerning what will happen on that day. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It is not the sayers, it is the doers. So the evidence that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ is not you just calling him Lord. But living your life like he is the Lord of your life. And this, by doing so, you are fulfilling or doing the will of the Father. And he goes on to say, many, and I want you to note that he says many, not few, Many will say to me in that day. That means in that day they will have access to Jesus. In that day, their rejection will be very clear. In that day, their judgment will be against what they believed before. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. Done wonders in your name. What is happening? What we are seeing here are gifts. So the gifts are not necessarily what qualifies you. Gifts are given. But fruit is cultivated. He says, and I will declare to them. Not one, to the many. What will he declare to them? He says, I never knew you. Seriously? You mean all the time? We are doing all this in your name. You did not know us. It is possible. Because you never had this relationship, personal relationship with the person of Jesus. And his finished work. That's sobering. 
Because he says, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Depart from me. What a sentence. When is is it happening? In that day. What will he say? I never knew you. Why? Because you practice. You habitually are lawless. So the law has been applied to you. The law of love and you have not lived the law of love. The law, according to God's word, God's standard doesn't change. So those who have received the law will be judged. When they miss the mark, she calls them lawless. Those who have not received the law will also be judged without the law. And that is something that we need to think about. Why will they be judged? Because in verse 14, He points out that instinctively they knew how to do the law. They instinctively knew the difference between right and wrong. You see, truth what is truth and what is not truth is black and white. So it is not something that is the, has a middle ground somewhere. So this is not referring to a ceremonial law. No, no, no. He is referring to the moral code of God as defined in the Ten Commandments. Things like not honoring your parents. Thou shall not steal. You should tell the truth. Love people, love your neighbor, show them compassion. All this is instinctively written in the hearts of every man. You see, even those that don't believe in God, when they are talking about justice, when they are talking about esteem for one another, what are they pointing to? There is an unwritten law upon their heart. And here he points out that they have this law written in their heart. Paul writes and says, in that they show the work of the law written in their heart. God has written the law upon the tablet of their heart. And they are now held accountable to God for the choices that they make. That is what he wants us to understand. That there is no individual on the face of this planet who is not accountable to him. Every one of us has been given a conscience. And he goes on to say, and if they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. So what does that mean? Every person on this earth has a conscience. A conscience is that 
which instinctively tells you that you have now crossed the line. It is that that tells you you have violated God's law. It, it, it is that that tells you at this point, like you have an alarm in the building, which may be an alarm against intrusion or an alarm against fire. So when something happens, when danger comes your way. This alarm sets off to alert you that there is danger. And this is what the conscience does to an individual. It tells you something is broken. Something is not right. And you see, this conscience has very many aspects. One, you may have what we call a clean conscience. You may have what we call a guilty conscience. You may have what we call a weak conscience. Or a strong conscience. So what happens? God deals with your conscience. And, and for many of us, our conscience is telling us, stop, 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 stop. It is that warning light. And what happens? When you keep on pushing, it's like you break all restraint. And you speed down that highway of sin. And when you go on that way, that, that is when you have what we call a seared conscience. So that means... When you obey God, when you turn in repentance to God, believe in Jesus Christ, and allow to be malleable, allow the word to inform your actions. Allow the spirit of God to lead and direct you. Paul tells us that as many as as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. So if you are not malleable to the Spirit, if you don't allow the Word of God to inform every action of yours, rather you allow the opinions of men, you allow philosophy, you allow your pride, you allow your sense of identity, your sense of worth to inform what you do. Over time, your conscience gets seared. And so the breaks of restraint are worn off. So what happens? Then you dig deeper into sin. And you begin to even... Get proud of what you do. Yes, and you reach a point where you cannot even hide it. You're so proud to strut it around for all to see. So, so you're no longer ashamed of what you are doing. Your, the Holy Spirit has been ignored completely. So your thoughts, and the Bible says their thoughts and are alternately are choosing them or defending them. 
So what is he trying to say? So thoughts have the ability to achieve or choose or to defend you. So depending on which side you are. So you now use the thoughts to defend what you do. So you see, Thoughts are connected to the conscience. And, and the conscience is bearing witness to what the thoughts are, are choosing you of. So if they don't bring conviction, for you to get back on track. Then what happens? You reject, throw everything out. Guilt gets over you and you throw it away. And what happens? You are defending them. So, so now they are defending you. So now you begin to look at the things that you have done the right to try and compensate for anything that you have not done that is wrong. So, so you think that by doing right, this will compensate for any other side where your conscience is telling you that this is wrong. Let me put it for you this way. It takes just one sin for you to stand before God. Guilty. Think about it. Missing the mark. Paul here tells us Paul that in that day, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Basically, there will be no postponement. There, there will be no out of court settlement. No, there, there will be no day of leave from God. In that day, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. Remember in chapter 2 verse 5, he says because of the stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What does that mean? That there will be a day when we will appear before Jesus Christ and give an account and the standard is by Jesus Christ, by his gospel. Not by our interpretation of his gospel. At that point, you don't come and say, no, you know, Lord, it was a misunderstanding. No. So he will judge everyone. And the standard is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, here we need to understand that it not only includes the message of salvation, when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it includes the message of condemnation. So, so that you who has been saved understand what it is you have been saved from. You see, many of us have this understanding that when you are get saved, you are saved from Satan. No, you are not saved from Satan. There is something worse than that. It is the righteous judgment 
judgment of God. So that is why you need to have the bad news. For you to appreciate the good news. So every sinner has been saved from something. So you cannot be saved unto something until you have been saved from something. So what have you been saved from? You have been saved from the wrath of God and his eternal condemnation. That's why Paul says, on the last day there will be judged according to my gospel. So what is he talking about the gospel, his gospel? It is the gospel of Christ. For which he is not ashamed to preach. So what does that mean? It means that God will judge. Every one of us. So what does judging mean? When it, when it points out that God will judge, it doesn't say that they will be saved and pardoned by God. So, so, so that after God has judged them, then he says, oh no, for you I forgive you. And then I pardon you. No, they will not, there is nothing like being even given a second chance. What Paul maintains here is that we will all be judged by God. Those without the law will be strictly judged without the law. But according to the law that is written in their heart, which is by Christ Jesus, because it is through him that the words were made. So the, everything is through him. It is unto him. And it is for him. So it is again according to his gospel that everything will be judged. And those without the law, he says, they will have their secrets exposed and judged. So what is happening here? God will unveil what it is that he has written on the heart and where we have missed the mark. And Paul calls it judging the secrets of men. So it is not just their acts. No, far, far more than exposing and condemn, condemning, it is their secret thoughts that will now be brought into the open. So the attitudes, the motives, the hidden thoughts, the selfish ambitions, the anger, the revenge, the hatred, all that will come out into the open on the last day before So you are going to be judged through Jesus Christ. So why is that so? Because the fact is this, whether you believe it or not, John 5.22 tells us that God the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to his son. So Jesus Christ, Revelation 20, and I will recap that because it is very important. We have an understanding of what will happen. 
tufuna okutegeera kwekye kiriba John the Revelator 20 from 11 tells us Yokane yawandike okubikulibwa musula ya bidyo kutaka mu nyoro 10 I saw a great white throne nenda bintebe nkuru nganjeru great power no beings of unji quite purity judgment. And him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So everything that we are depending on will disappear before his throne. That is why placing everything on earth is a recipe for disaster. Because all this will flee. Now imagine all the evidence you have is on earth and the earth and the heaven flee from his presence. So what you are left with is what you have done that meets the righteous requirements of God. The Bible says there was found no place for them. And he says, and I saw the dead, small and great. Very important here. We see the great people of repute, people that have left the mark, people that have lived life to the fullest. And the small ones, those that are insignificant. What is the equalizer? They are all dead. And then what is the second? They're all standing before the throne of God. All standing. There is no one given a chair. All are standing. It's like they're in a dock, both great and small. The land and the unland. So when we understand this, it hampers us. Because there is a moment where they will all stand. And what happens? And the books were opened. Which means God has an impeccable record of every individual life. How you lived it in light of the purpose that he put upon your life. And the Bible says, and the dead were judged according to their works. The Bible says, by the things written in the books. If the books were open now of your life, what would be the record there? I want you to think about that. Because it is a very sobering question. And look at what has happened. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up their dead. Imagine. For me, it is great and small. Where are all? They are all in death and Hades and the sea. And all were judged according to their works. Why is that important? Because at another point in Revelation, he tells us that our works go with us. We don't leave them here. But he says that if there is one book that was open, which is the book of life. And and if anyone was not found in the book, 
Where you now tasa and give up one dikiba mulin mister life, they were cast in the lake of fire. A chobulamu ya suliba munyanje yomulido. That is the second day. So, where taking us back to where we began, that it will be before Jesus Christ, where all will be judged. Those without the law. And those with the law. Paul later even tells us. Paul in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. He says, For we already charged, we have already charged both Jews and Greeks. All under sin. So the Greek are those without the law. The Jews are those that have the law. All have been judged. And Romans 6.23 He says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, even though you are not under the law, the fact is you are still under the curse of sin without Jesus Christ. So, what, and there is no other penalty but to spend all eternity in the lake of fire. And he said, but that's not fair. Romans 5, 12 tells us, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. Hamatia, all missed the mark. So through when Adam disobeyed, Adam Jema, the entire generation of who we are we all sin. And that is why faith in Jesus Christ is important. And that is why I appeal to those that have received the saving faith. Grace. It is upon us to preach this gospel. Romans 10 tells us how will they call upon him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? Remember. Even if they have not heard, they are still condemned. The only way for them to get out of that mess is when the message of salvation is preached to them. But how will they hear unless somebody has preached to them? And he goes on to say, in verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring the glad tidings of good things. Why? Because faith, in verse 17, comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So we have to be steadfast with this message. Now you may say, should I now go to China? No. These are people you are with right now. They work with you in your office. They surround you at your workplace. They are the people God brings to invite you to lunch with them. It is that person that pulls that chair next to you and says, may I see it? It is that person that you 
are going with on your way home. They are into your family. They marry into your family. They live in your neighborhood. They are the people you meet on your way to work. They are the people who community thinks they are very good people. They need Jesus Christ. They may be self-righteous, they may be honest people, they need Jesus Christ. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to preach this gospel to them without faith. Because it is the only remedy for them to get out of the mess they are in. Now, for you who has not received Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, this is your time. Why don't you say this prayer with me from the bottom of your heart? Believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Invite him in your life as your personal Lord and Savior. Because we have seen today those without the Lord will also perish. Why? Because they will be judged. Like those under the law. The only remedy is faith in Jesus Christ. Place your faith right now in Jesus Christ. And begin this relationship where the eternal life of God will flood your heart and change your destiny forever. Why don't you pray this prayer? The God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, the revealer of your grand promise of salvation to all mankind. I thank you because you sent Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, to die on the cross of Calvary for my sins. Today I believe that Jesus, you are the savior of the world. You are the savior of mankind. I invite you in my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Save me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Purify my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Erase my past. Give me hope and the future. That you died for that I may attain. Thank you for saving me. Amen. 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 If you have prayed that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been wonderfully saved. The man on the cross of Calvary, one of the thieves, he said, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me. It takes faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And his work and salvation is yours. There is a number on your screen. Please call it. Someone will give you the first instructions you need. Why? Because they are important for you to take those baby steps that will lead to giant strides in the kingdom. Many of us think, no, I think I already know something. No, take the baby steps, learn. It, that's the path that we take. 
And that's what has made us who we are right now. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So from Dominion Church, I still implore those of you that are wonderfully saved. Please, let's take this gospel to the ends of the earth. To every man, every woman, every child that we meet. Let's not stop talking about his saving grace. The amazing grace that saved the wretch like me. Let it reach out to everyone. Tell them that Jesus saved. So from Dominion Church, we're saying it's been a blessing to have you today. Let's take the message to the rest of the world. Until we meet, God richly bless you. Shalom. Bidembe.